What? You think of iced coffee? Iced coffee? Have you iced coffee? Claire came in with? Yes. I know you're wrong. So you be with the, the class. What kind of coffee? Even with the class. Know? How did Moses like his coffee? <laughs> well, or how do you like his tea, right? He brews it. He brews it. Oh, that's good. He brews it. I like that. I like that. These, these aren't really uh, highly strange words per se. Uh, e N O S. So, L E G E K O M E N O S, E G E K O M E N O S, which the basis of the word is El E G K O, El E G O. To confute or admonish. To confute or admonish. And you know what's interesting is um, Greek Greek doesn't have a lot of words. I mean, it's considered a sparse word language, much sparser than English. You know, English has the most million words of any language. Greek is very common. That is what I mean is very similar to other ancient languages. So very sparse. But we have a few words. What's interesting is you notice this isn't a there's no suffix prefix. This is a, a, a specific verb that is, you know, a word unto itself. To confute or admonish. And you know, something to think about is when you find a word like that, it means that it's a primary word, which means it's a primary concept or thought in the language. Just like in Anglo Saxon, run, right? Walk. Swim. They're primary words. They're not created with prefixes, suffixes, and they're not. They don't have antecedents. They don't have words that are. They're the basis. Now this word is really interesting, and we should get to the verse. Um, uh, D D E I A S. Pad D S. This is a very very common word in the New Testament. But what's very what's interesting about this word? Okay, look at the word. It's not. It, it is from padeo, from pace, from peo, the primary verb to hit. Now, what does this word mean? Okay, so the basis of the word is peo, which means to hit. Specifically, the word padeo is a boy, or by analogy, a girl, or a child or a slave or a servant, specifically a slave or a servant, especially to a minister and a king, it means literally to train up a child. They say, why does it mean, what, what, how did you get padeia, train up a child from the basis of the word hit? And the reason is because we know that in ancient societies, okay, well, first of all, I've been writing about this a lot in my blogs, but in Greek education, we know, as a matter of fact, we know until the age of education, until the, until the age of universal education, which is a really important point, about 1830s, the end of the age of enlightenment, do you know the age before that is called the, the age of universal literacy? People learn literacy, they learn to read and write without going to school. They, they, if, in the accounts we have from the, the 1700s, 1800s, 1600s, before the age, before they started sending kids to school, the mother usually taught the kid to read in a day. Sometimes it took a week, but if it took a week, the kid was slow. They learned to read the uh, King James Bible in a day. And then they were participating, usually around seven years old, six, seven years old, in the readings of the family every night. Because the families always did readings every night from the Bible in every household. So we know that people learn in the age of literacy, which was before the age of universal education, everyone was pretty much literate. You know why, right? They wanted to read. Because they had the penny novels. The novels, you know, the age of the Enlightenment, I've told you about, you know, underwear made paper cheap, and that made, you know, books cheap. And that's when Daniel Defoe wrote his first novel, Robinson Crusoe, at the end of the 1700s, which was the beginning of the novel. Because now all of a sudden people can afford to buy books, and everybody wanted to read books. From the, the, the simplest girl who was working as a rag picker, to the wealthiest person in the society. 
But the Romans, or the Greeks and the Romans, you didn't send kids to school to learn to read. You sent them to school. Basically, the Greeks sent them to school to do one thing to begin with. What's the one thing that Greeks sent them to school to do? Fight. Huh? Fight. Fight. Yeah, fight. To be a military, to, to learn military, right? And then the other thing, because they call them gymnasiums, what the other thing they wanted to learn to do? Sports. Sports. Yeah, well, and then athletics, right? So I teach you to fight, but, but I want you to be strong. Because if you're if you're huffing and puffing over the battlefield and trying to pull your sword and you can't do it, you know, you're a weakling, then you're out of there. But later, they wanted to learn to think, right? So they had to memorize the poems, they had to memorize the stuff. So I sent them to school to learn to fight, learn, you know, athletics, and to learn to think, you know, to understand the Greek poetry and, and be able to talk about it in a symposium, for example. And so this is really important. So you see the Greek and the Roman, to a degree, idea of education was based in physical, physicality, right? So, well, well uh, all right, all the women maybe not as much as the guys, but what did they make you do when you were in your sports? The first thing they said, Run a lap, right? Or get down and give me 20, or right? What did you do? That it was a lot of pain and suffering in athletics to build up. So how did you get boys, whatever, to do what you needed them to do, right? You, yeah, you know, the rod. And so in the Greek, the word to train up a child comes from the word boy, and the word boy comes from the word to hit with impunity. Now, I just want to point this out. Padea means to train up a child. It means to educate, to discipline by punishment, tutorage, education or training, by implication, disciplinary correction, by implication. So in other words, okay, remember, it started with military training and athleticism, but then it moved to thinking, right? So. Yeah, the word has the basis of to hit or strike. But what do you think it really means? I mean, what do you think it means in this period of Koine Universal <coughs> Greek? <coughs> to educate a child. By whatever means necessary, right? So if the child needs a little bit of, well, we know children many times need a little encouragement, right? <laughs> or, if it, or if it means the encouragement of, Writing or whatever you need, right? It means to educate a child. Yeah, but so that would be the same root word as pediatrician or encyclopedia. Would that those pediatrician definitely encyclopedia maybe? Yeah, yeah. E education. I don't know if child's in there, but yes, pedi. The pedia means to educate, and um, it, so, and pay paid pace means a child, a boy. It, but by analogy, also a girl. So it can mean any child. But my point is this, um, all right, if I were to see this word in Koine and Greek, and we w might, we will, right, what would I say it means to educate a child, especially to educate your child, right? You notice that even the Bible says by implication, disciplinary correction, but it means education or training or tutorage. So if I used it to mean disciplinary correction or discipline, what would you say? You'd probably say it better have something that indicates that. Remember, Greek is, is that kind of language. It's concrete. So if I were to say this is disciplinary correction as opposed to uh, educating a child by whatever means, right? And also I want to point out something else. Well, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that. Um, so we are in verse 3, and I said that we were going to, there's a little bit more we need to look at that. Okay, so we already parsed it. I'll read it in the NIV. This is verse 3 and 12. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. But we translated this as estimate assigning a reason who stayed under this sort of opposite logos, under whose, those, who missed the mark themselves because you did not toil and relaxed your unconscious breath. 
and you did not, and relaxed your unconscious breath. So we were parsing this a little bit, and I said the really important thing about this is number one, they're saying, they're specifically saying, we've gone back before, they are witnesses, right? This comes from the previous chapter, the pistis chapter, the persuaded chapter. The whole point of the persuaded chapter is what I put up in the top there. It's two, assigning a reason this and members of the Israel Sanhedrin became a witness. We went through all the witnesses, and we came down to the point, and basically in 12 it said, you are the witnesses. That is, the Hebrews, the people they're writing to are the witnesses. So the witnesses of Jesus Christ, the persuaded of Jesus Christ. The point of this is, to answer to those who hold the anti-logos. The anti-logos is what? What is the anti-logos? I have the gospel, gospel, which is the gospel is is the uh, message of the gods, and we would say the message of God, right? So what's the anti-logos? Not being convinced. Yeah, not being convinced or the opposite message, right? So remember, and what's really cool about this is who is the Logos? What is the Logos? Christ. Christ. Yeah, Christ. And the reason he's the Logos, I mean, you know, we, we spout, you know, I don't mean it in a negative way. We say these things not realizing. Remember I told you, in the beginning it says in the Hebrew, in the beginning it was Elohim, God's. With a singular verb. And gods, the spirit of gods, the ruach, the ruach was over the waters. And Elohim Amar. What it says in the Greek Septuagint is, in the beginning God and the penuma of God rested on the waters, and God, Logos. God made the command word, the Logos, the logical argument that created the universe. What it says in John is, in the beginning, Theos, God, and the Logos was with God. The word was with God. The Logos was with God. And God spoke the Logos, and out of the Logos, everything that was created was created. John starts with basically the Septuagint quote about the creation of the earth and the fact that the Logos with, with God. So what is the anti-Logos? You might say, you might try to say the Antichrist, but it's not, right? Like a lie or a falsehood? Maybe? Like um, the, opposite, the opposite of what God desires or the opposite of what God would speak. Which is possible because of why? Sarks, Suke, and Panuma. The Panuma is the conscious breath. <gasps> the free will. This is free will. Free will. The Suke is thought. It's the unconscious breath. The Greeks believe you thought no matter what. That's what made you a human. And the Sarks is the body. So... You notice the panuma of God, the free will of God. And likewise, human beings have free will. And therefore, the anti-logos is the free will of man opposing God. So my point is this. Okay, so they are the witnesses. The answer to those who hold to the anti-logos, to who, those who are not convinced, is the easiest way of saying it, right? is to continue to the, use the suke and discourse and, and to communicate. This is a message from the very beginning, right? So it isn't giving up the work, don't relax the mind. Okay, I'll read it again. Estimate, assigning a reason who stayed under this sort of opposite logos, opposite logos, anti-logos, under those who missed the mark themselves because you did not toil and relaxed your unconscious breath. In other words, 
you stop thinking and you stop talking to them about it. So what what is what has happened is we have gone from the the chapter on persuasion on being persuaded to the chapter on persuading others. How do you persuade others? How, and, and by the way, this is a continuing logos to tell us because remember, the book started that way. The document started that way with how do you interact in this society? How do you interact in this culture as teen hodos? And so we're moving into that. Now, there is, um, I don't know, I, there are some, uh, what do you call them, uh, uh, citations from the Old Testament, but I don't think they're, they're super worthwhile. Uh, there are a lot of times direct quotations, and these are not necessarily direct quotations. So I'm going to move on to four. So with this in mind, let's look at four. Remember, this is about... How do you persuade and how do you get, how do you, well, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, here it goes. Here's, here's the NIV. In your struggle against sin, you have not re resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Okay? Let's see what it says in the Greek. <clears throat> Ye have is added. Not yet. It's upo. Not yet. Resisted. <coughs> anti kathistimia Literally, to set down troops. Anti-Kathistimia. It's a military term meaning to set down troops. Against. Unto Merchi, as far as Hamia. Anti-Gonosimei, to struggle against. Against, it's not against, it's pro, sport to Hamantia. So here's a literal translation. Not ha yet have you set down troops against, as far as blood, struggling against Ford to miss the mark. So here's a translation. You have not yet set down troops as far as risking your own blood, Ford to in the struggle against miss the mark. You've been persuaded, but what are you doing about it? You've been persuaded but you haven't got skin in the game. We'd say, yeah, where's your skin in the game, right? And all the beginning of, of Hebrews, remember, it talked about um, you uh, don't just go to the epi-synagogue. Don't plant in the epi-synagogue, right? Obviously, what's happened is they were kicked out of the synagogue. But don't plant in the epi-synagogue, the synagogue that includes the believers, the teen hodos, and all the other you know, groups of, of, Ju of the Judaic groups. Don't plant yourself in the temple. Matter of fact, if you do, you're not following the law, and you're not following what they said God would want, even though you are following the traditions of the Jewish people, right? In the sacrifice. So, the thing is, You've been persuaded, and the persuasion was, and I'll give you a hint, it's a secret, it's a trick, it's the truth. You know, we went all along in Hebrews, and we laid down a foundation of the information, and then we suddenly got to the persuasion chapter, and the persuasion chapter basically said, hey, you're a witness, you are persuaded, right? Persuaded of what? Persuaded of all this other stuff that he talked about. And now he's going to say, what do you do about it? And so the last two chapters, specifically chapter 12, but then we get to chapter 13. Chapter 13 is closing the letter and there's other information in there. But 12 is all about how, what do I need to do? And so we get this and he goes, okay, and you're... Uh, you have not yet set down troops as far as risking your own blood for it to in the struggle against Miss the Mark. And by the way, I want to point out, I think pastors said something really beautiful, and I don't know if I can make the conclusion for it properly. But, oh, sins of commission and omission, right? The concept of the sin of omission is really close to this Miss the Mark, right? Yeah. What is the Mark? So, the Mark, he's doing the Good Samaritan today, so I'm giving you a, pre, a preview. But the Good Samaritan today, right, 
those missed the mark whose job was to help their neighbor, right? So they didn't do what they should have done. And so the idea of miss the mark is a very powerful concept. And like I said, you know, if you were to follow the law, well, you know, that's what happened. A pastor didn't make as big a deal about it, but, you know, the crease was making a judgment. Is me following the law and remaining clean so that I can participate in Taruma and also as a priest more important than a life of a person? And the Levite was thinking the same thing, right? He was making a judgment, and his judgment was, well, me remaining clean, but what do you think Jesus would say? <laughs> remaining clean is meaningless if you're letting somebody die, right? I mean, I think this is beautiful because we get this, you know, the, the, the Hebrew is showing us this, not just telling us, but giving us pictures, right? Just like Jesus kind of gave the parables, right? It's a picture. I also thought his conclusion about uh, uh, the woman in the well is pretty cool, but if you haven't heard the sermon, you, you'll enjoy it. This Maccabees has a quote in 2 Maccabees 20, specifically related to this. So I don't know if it fits as well, but anyway, um, in 1314, or 1314, 2 Maccabees, committing the decision to the creator of the world and exhorting his troops to fight bravely to the death for the laws, temple, city, country, and commonwealth, he pitched his camp near Modin. So this is about the, um, during the Maccabean uh, assault, and this is, uh, we don't, it's not a direct quote, but it's a um, analogy. It's a, it's a, what do you call it? A, uh, Illusion. What's that? Illusion. Illusion, yes. Illusion that the writer was probably familiar with it. And so I'm not going to read the whole of Maccabees, but it's, it's worthwhile probably to look back at Maccabees 13 to see what the rabbinic context is of that. Let's go on to 5. Because here's where the real point gets. The previous was pretty much a work in, but here's what 5 says in the NIV. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebu rebukes you. Right? Let's see what this says in the Greek, because this is really different. And, Kai, have you forgotten? Ele ethomei. To be, uh, to be utterly oblivious of, not forgotten, to be utterly oblivious of, the ho, the exhortation, paraclesis, near clesis, near call, the imploration, in other words, the call, the near call, which, hostis, which some diolegomei, to say thoroughly, to, to say thoroughly, unto you, homen to you, and that's interesting because human is um, literally to you. So we have a specific pronoun here. As is hos, which how. And by the way, sometimes you see hos like hos like this. And it's ho, he, ho, hos, see, which this is which how. And then there is also hos, which is a pronoun which is that. So just don't get confused. Um, I've, I noted that, and I've started to expand on it in the thing, but um, this is H-I-C-E, heis, heis, anyway, which out. Undo children, wheels, offspring, my, of me, boy, of me, so another pronoun, hoyos, despise, oligorio, to have little regard for, not, May, um, it, may is not. Thou is added. Thee is added. Chasing, the de, um, that's not de de a de. It's te de a de. It's it's that word right there. The tutorage of the Lord of the Curios, supreme in authority. Nor many, but not faith, uh, faint. Ek luo. To relax when thou art rebuked. Ele giko. To confute. Of, it's not of, it's under 
him himself, autos. Okay. So here's a literal translation. And to be utterly oblivious of the importation which some to say thoroughly to which how offspring, offspring of me to have little regard for not tutorage of supreme and authority, but not to relax to confute under himself. Okay, okay. I know that's, these are very complex sentences in Greek. So here's a translation of this that is literal, pretty literal. And you are utterly oblivious of the imploration, importation, the calling, which some explain thoroughly to you as if you were their offspring. Offspring of me don't show little regard for the tutorage of the supreme and authority, but don't be relaxed to prove a person wrong under himself. So we'll parse this a little bit, but the point I want to make is this. Look at what the, they did in the King James and in the NIV. They took the word padeus and they turned it into the word discipline. The word is to tutor a child or to train up a child. Now I think this says more about English King James society and also the German society because Martin Luther did something similar and also the Swiss more than it says something about the Greek or the Roman because obviously I took the word to train up a child remember I told you the basis of the word is to strike without with impunity right and then it meant a boy or a child whom you could strike with impunity, but the word came to mean in Greek to train a child. But like I told you, the Greek educational system went from purely military to athletics to reasoning. So what we see in late Greek is you're not, it doesn't mean you're beating your child every day. It means that you were educating the child to prepare them for manhood. And by the way, how, what age did the Greeks consider their ch children to be adults, men? 30 years old. 30. Yeah, the Hebrews considered their children when they, when they, were, when they had pubic hair and were 12. Boys. Uh, no. Yeah, pubic hair and 12 when they're boys. Is that right? Uh, or 13, and then girls were 12 with pubic hair, a little bit younger. But in that was the Romans. I mean, that was the Hebrews. But the Greeks did not consider you adult male until you had served your time in the military and made a name for yourself and had the money to be able to now have a wife and a family. So you had to be 30 years old before you were trained up. So when we say train up a child of Pideus, we're not talking about, you know, our view is like it's a little kit, right? But the view of the Greeks and the view of this society is not that at all. So, and, and as a matter of fact, you know, this view came into, uh, um, okay, I don't know what we do anymore, but what was usually the age of maturity in, a, in the Western world, for men especially? 18. 18 to 21, right? Depending on the country or the society. But usually they were apprenticed when they were, what, 15, 12 to 15? And then by the time they were that age, they were considered they had to be journeymen or they weren't progressing, right? So you, when you were a journeyman and you actually came into your, your work, then that was, that was it. So the point I want to make to you is you, could, you can take this word to mean discipline. But look at the sentence structure. Look at the structure in the Greek. Is there anything here that would lead you to believe that this word uh, tutorage or train up a child should be, should be like discipline? The only thing that gives you the idea is that there is a quote from the Septuagint. But guess what? The quote from the Septuagint gives you the same word in the Septuagint. Now, I didn't go and dig into it in Hebrew, but I think you'll all agree with me. 
being a child and training up a child are two different things. And one is ancillary to the other. I'm not encouraging you to go beat children. I'm just saying that, that the reason you might spank a child is to train them up. But the purpose is not to hit them. It's to train them, right? And so I'm just arguing that, especially since what I told you, this chapter is all about what you should do. So let's look at it within that context. And you are utterly oblivious of the importation which some explain thoroughly to you as if you were their offspring. So in other words, okay, so someone else explain the gospel to you, right? The gospel is explained to you, but you're acting utterly oblivious to it. Offspring of me, my offspring, I should have said my offspring, don't show little regard for the training, the tutorage of the supreme authority. But don't be relaxed to prove a person wrong under himself. All right? Remember it told us in the previous one, don't be relaxed. In other words, don't stop thinking, right? So this is saying that, number one, you're not, you're not supposed to try to prove someone wrong, right? Especially when they're pronouncing the gospel, right? Don't, in other words, don't have, like, uh, I think James talks about it too. Don't, don't just make arguments for the sake of argument, right? I mean, if you're agreeing on certain points, just agree on the certain points and go about it. I think that's what he means, but there, there's a lot in this. You are utterly oblivious of the importation which some explain thoroughly to you as if you were their offspring. In other words, other people trained you up, right, in the gospel. And that's why you were persuaded. So my offspring don't show little regard for the tutorage of the supreme authority. In other words, for the tutorage, the training of Christ. And don't be relaxed to prove a person wrong under himself. In other words, don't, don't, don't use your knowledge to try to argue or confute others who are doing... In other words, what are you supposed to do? Use your think... Go ahead. Get, get. I was going to say you're supposed to train others, too. Yeah, you're yeah. You're supposed to be then the next gen training the next generation. It becomes even clearer. I just want to point out to you, look at what it says in the translation. In the NIV, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. Hmm? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. That is not what it says in the Greek at all. And it misses the whole point in the Greek, because we're already seeing the point of this chapter is you are witnesses, you are persuaded, but what do you do about it? So the number one thing it said that you're supposed to do about it, if you remember back before, it said there's a cloud of witnesses proclaiming the truth and we're running the race. But it was an ironic statement about running the race but not running the race at the same time. It's really a beautiful statement in there in Greek irony. But then it goes on and it says, okay, someone else taught you, told you the gospel so that now you are persuaded. So what do you do about it? Um, there are some, and, and I, I'm not going to go into all these, there are some allusions to this. Um, we can specifically look at Job. Uh, Job 5, 17 is basically the, um, it's very interesting because it's, it's, it is the quote that this is making from the Septuagint in Job 17. Um, there's... Uh, we should probably read around this stuff. I'll, I'll read 16. So the poor have hope, and injustice shuts its mouth. Blessed is the man whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. From six calamities he will escape you, and seventh no harm will befall you. In family he will reason you from death, and in battle from the stroke of the sword you'll be protected. So... This is interesting, too. We don't have time to go parse it in the, in the Hebrew or look at it really deeply, but you notice 
Mm. This is an interesting quote in itself because it doesn't match very well the context. Anyway, there are some other ones. Um, uh, sorry, is, go ahead. isn't it directly from Proverbs 3, 11, and 12? Um, there are quite a few. Let's look at Proverbs 3, 11, 12. I've got that here too. Um, let's see. Now, there's a bunch that are really close to this and very similar, but Proverbs, I got Proverbs in here. I think I've got it. Did I put it in the notes there? Proverbs 3. Um, yeah, uh, my son, don't forget your my teaching. And then it says, uh, 9, honor your Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then 10, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. This is one of those, this is one of those interesting things. You know what happens? Like, for example, um, the best example is, you know where it says, and a virgin will conceive and bear a son, Right? The word in, in Hebrew is not virgin. It's a presumed virgin. It's, uh, young what's that? It's like young maiden. Or well, literally an unmarried girl. And so the presumption is that it means she is a virgin, right? You Greek, the Hebrew does not have a word for virgin. But Greek does, parthenos. And so what happened is when, they tra- when the Septuagint translated the word, they put in... Parthenos, because that's the presumption culturally. And in our translations forever, we would say Parthenos, because we would say virgin, because it's the Greek translation, and the people understood the Hebrew. But what happened when the New New American Standard came out? The New American Standard was famous for this. All the quotes in the New Testament are from the Septuagint, right? So... Usually the scholars would go back to the Septuagint because they understood Greek better than they understood Hebrew. Well, the New American Standard went back and they said, we're going to translate the Old Testament properly, so we're going to put all the Hebrew words in. So they, they translated the Isaiah chapter, I think it's Isaiah, as young woman. So then they went through and they said, well, to be more accurate than the New Testament, what are we going to do? We can't have a Septuagint quote in the New Testament. God forbid. So then they went through and they put in Matthew, and a young woman will conceive. So they lost all the cultural annotation based in that word. You see see my point? This is really similar to that. So I did not parse the Hebrew. If we parse the Hebrew, it may be discipline. But guess what? In the Septuagint, I did look it up. It's pedes. So it's train a child. So the point is this. If we take the Septuagint word and put it in, we get train up a child or tutorage, right? Education. If we go back and we look at the King James or we look at the Hebrew, especially the King James or the older Bibles, we get discipline. So what, what, did our new, what did our new scholars want to do? They took the word discipline and put it in there when the better fit may be, and I think it is, I, I'd argue it is, because look at, looks what it's telling us. What is more important within the context of this? Is, dis, is it discipline of the Lord? What's the focus of the Logos? Right the word. Yeah, teaching. Teaching, not discipline. Yes, sir? Well, the, the dictionary des- definition for discipline is to teach, but there's negative consequences for failure to learn. Okay. So it's, it's related to teaching, but it's not, it's not strictly the, the consequences by itself. So. Right, discipline comes from disciple, so. Yeah. Well... The picture, the picture that our writers are trying to give us is not negative. <clears throat> the whole picture of chapter 11 was 
They were persuaded. And not only that, it wasn't David or Samson or, you know, all the really good guys, right? It was Rahab, Abel. It, it was the losers, right, to a degree, right? They're the ones he's talking about. And the whole point was, you know, was it because of discipline that they did what they did? What made them do what they did? What, what was the singular aspect that made them do what they did? They were convinced. I don't. I'm not going to convince Brett by beating him with a stick. Hey, Brett. Yeah, right. I could try. You know, it, it, maybe it might work. I don't know. You know, I mean, they, they try to torture people all the time, right, and brainwash them, but you know, it doesn't work very well, right? It's not a positive way to convince people. How do you convince people? Um, today, we've learned, you know, one of the best ways. Maybe we relearned it, right? Um, in, in a relationship with people to talk to them about Jesus Christ, to talk to them about important things about their lives, and that's true of everything, right? Whether it's helping a person, uh, you know, mature. Or teach them about God. Yes, sir. I'm not sure you can convince people. You have to convince yourself. If it's going to take, you've got to convince yourself. They, they've got to show them, but they have to accept it. It's, it they, they have to be, it, it's, you own that. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. That is a perfect lead in. Let's look at six. Look what it says. Six, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. That's what the NIV says. Here's what it says in the Hebrew, in the Greek. For Gar, assigning a reason, whom, hos, this is uh, the, that is the pronoun, hos, whom thee is added, kurios, supreme authority, agapeo, love of the gods, pedeo, pedeo, he trains up like a child. And, but, Scourges, mastego, to flog every pos, all offspring, whom he para de coma, to accepts near. So let's see what it says. Let's see what, what the thing, literally. Assigning a reason whom supreme authority loved of the gods, he trains up a child, but flogs all offspring, offspring whom he accepts near. Okay? There is a disciplinary thing in here. And that fits kind of with the Greek way of thinking, also probably too much with the Anglo-Saxon way of thinking. But okay, Assign, here's a translation. Assigning a reason, those whom a supreme authority of the gods loves, he trains up like his children, but he flogs all offspring whom he accepts near. Okay? So we're training up a child, but there is a disciplinary aspect, you know, I don't think the impression here is he beats someone because you come near to God, he beats you, right? But the fact is, the biggest deal in this is Harmantia. Miss the mark. So the encouragement is you want to hit the mark. Now, I don't think hitting a person while they're trying to pull the bow is a good idea. You see, you have to fit this culturally. Because even if I have the picture, the Greeks... The Greeks are very, very geometric and very visual, right? It's all concrete. So they didn't talk about harmantia, but the point is that you're training up like his children. What well, the important thing to note in this, I think, is assigning a reason those whom supreme authority of the gods loves. He trains up like his children, but he flogs all offspring whom he accepts near. And there is, uh, yeah, there are some direct quotes. I don't know. Um, I've got too many of these because I was using a different source for a lot of these allusions and quotes. Um, and again, it's the Proverbs one, my son, don't despise the Lord's discipline, don't resent. There's a few others in a few other places. But I think it's more important. Let's go on because I, I want to get to your point. I think it's in seven. Um, yeah, it's in, it's in seven. <coughs> this is what the NIV says. Endure hardship is discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And here's what it says in the Greek. Ice, two. Two, ye endure. Hopomenai, to stand or behind, chastening, pedea, tutorage, training up a child. God fails, dealeth, prospero, to bear towards. Um, remember the word prospero? 
that's to bear towards a sacrifice, costero. So God is bearing a sacrifice with you, human, as which how, with his added, Julio's offspring. For Gar, signing a reason, what son, Julio's, is he, Esti? It's Esti. It's the, it's the primary pronoun. Whom, Paul's whom, the is added, Potter, chasteneth, Padeo, train up as a child, not. Okay, so here's the literal. To stay under behind tutelage, God bears towards with you, which how offspring is signing a reason. What offspring is he whom a father trains up a child not? In other words, here's a little translation. To remain under tutorage, God bears towards you, with you, as offspring. Assigning a reason, what offspring is he whom a father doesn't train up as his child? So, the point in the writing, the author is pointing us to the, to the whole idea of training. Now, okay, what kind of training? The thing is that um, I think we don't take this literally enough. So, you know, sometimes our idea of training is, oh, I'm just living my life, right? And, and bad things happen to me and good things happen to me and I'm living my life. What do you think it means here? What does you think he means by training of God? What is the training of God? In a Greek sense. He sets circumstances in front of you in your life and you're supposed to learn from those. I think that's a reasonable um, understanding of it. I think it's more than that though. I think it's, it's all right, you're not going to like this. It's like the, the gymnasium, right? <coughs> The gymnasium. Every Greek male below maturity would go to the gymnasium every day. And at the gymnasium, what would he do? Compete. Exercise. Yeah, exercise, compete. Huh? No, I, I'm saying the same thing. Learn. Yeah. What's that? Learn, learn train. Yeah, learn. He, he, would, he would learn, and the thing he learned, there would be a scroll slave there, and a the scroll slave would be reciting um, Hepides or the myths, or zeals, or, you know, today the reading is this, right? And he would learn, he would learn, memorize the text. He would exercise in military things, but he had to do what? Go to the... And he had to do something about it, right? His mind was not relaxed. In other words, he engaged his sart, suke, and the Greeks would say panuma. So I don't disagree with you that the author is implying that things are set ahead of us and we have to overcome them you know, with Christ. But I don't think that's what he's really saying. I don't think that's the full body of what he's saying. He's saying the reason you're having problems is because you're not exercising the way even a, a basic Greek person would do, right? And the Romans... I don't know if you read Centurion, but you know that the Romans, when they trained, you know, they didn't do much edumacation. The edumacation they did was in, you know, what we would consider edumacation is, you know, how to do military formations, how to do military tactics, how to do military stuff. But most of the time, they were marching, right, and using heavy weapons and, and training, right? And so the Greek and the Roman... And the, well, maybe the Egyptians, no, they're, they're mummifying people. No, no, the Egyptians even did, you know, normal stuff. The point I'm making is that the, we are not supposed to relax our minds, our suke, our conscious or unconscious breath. We are supposed to use them because the Greeks would say, how do you train a child? How do you train people, Right. for uh, in their struggle against sin like were they trying to figure stuff out I mean it's, it seems like that's the context like you know you've forgotten these things let me go back to four let's see four. your struggle against sin 
Yeah, well, remember I said, here's a translation. You have not yet set down troops as far as risking your own blood for it. And I think you're right on. Especially, you know, in the NIV it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. But the translation we made is, you have not yet set down troops as far as risking your own blood for two in the struggle against Miss the Mark. I, so is it all about training? You guys aren't training, you're not doing, you know, it's okay, the discipline, blah, blah, blah. It, it takes work to struggle against sin. Yes, and not just to struggle against sin. It, let let me put it in mark, context. Right. The context, you know, when we read that about you have not set down troops and you've not, you know, shed your blood, we think about going to war, right? Mm -hmm. What do the Greeks think about? They think about going to the gymnasium. Look, look. What was one of the main sports? Well, they did a couple of sports. Boxing, mm -hmm. wrestling, running, running throwing yeah, stuff. Throwing. Faking battles, guess what? Every time you back, came back from the gymnasium, if you didn't have a bloody nose, and maybe a broken nose, and maybe your cheek, you know, had a big, because what were they doing? Did they have bo uh, boxing gloves? You know, and, and you know, you, you finally get on the ground, you cry uncle, but you know what, you don't want to cry uncle. You never cried uncle, right, if you were a Greek, a Spartan, right? You'd rather have a broken arm and go back to your mom and say, hey, mom, I broke my arm because I didn't cry uncle, right? So when, when they say shedding of blood, they're not talking about going to war. They're talking about what they did every day as men to train. And what the author is telling them is he's writing this, he's writing a picture to them, right? And I'm glad you brought that up, Tammy, because that's, that's precisely the point that we see in the seven. You know, in the NIV, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating his sons for what son is not disciplined by his father. But in the translation, to remain under tutorage, God bears towards you, with you as offspring, assigning a reason what offspring is he whom a father doesn't train up as his child. And by the way, what did the Greek father do for his son? He said, Go to the gymnasium. If he had to, he took him by the hand to the gymnasium. What the author is saying, do I have to take you by the hand and lead you to where you're going to learn? Right? See? The whole other part was, well, here's all this stuff that you know. You're persuaded. What are you doing about it? Right? And if you remember, it said at the beginning, if you don't understand something, you should go ask your... Your neighbor, right? Ask your neighbor about it. Um, there, is, there is some Deuteronomy stuff. Psalm of Solomon, which is really interesting. Um, this is one that, in the Psalm of Solomon is an apocryphal document, so I mentioned it's 10-2. We should really look at the context. I did not grab the context. The one who prepares his back for the whip shall be purified, for the Lord is good to those who endure discipline. And that basically goes back to 6 more than it does to 7. I think it's very interesting. Um, I, they're not talking about asceticism. I, they could be in the apocryphal document, but, but they're not talking about asceticism. They're t although, uh, as you know, if you studied that medieval period, they uh, kind of, some of them kind of did go off the wall with that. But the point is, the point I, the point I want to make, and as we look at this, because I'm going to stop here and give you a, another piece of information that I think is really neat. But um, as you read this. Take all the ones that talk about discipline and a lot of the ones about chastisement. If you look in the translation I give you and instead put in train up a child or tutorage or education. But remember, it's this Greek worldview about education is what we would call, well, we consider a well-rounded education the classics. The Greeks would say, "Well, if you're not doing if you're not doing battle studies and, and athletics, and you're not that's how can that be well-rounded, right?" And if you know at Merrick, if you read the second mission, you know one of the big deals is they uh, they had a, actually had a sacrifice for them to eat from in the gym. So if you went to the gym, you get a sacrifice. What I want to mention is, remember we talked about mystery and miracle plays. Um, my, uh, Rick's not here. He's I know, Rick's not here. I'll have to bring it next time. But in this book, this is a really cool book that my parents had. 
a standard treasury of learning, Funk and Wagon's Dictionary for Young People. And this is a section on theater. And what it talks about is actors, angels, and thereafter, after the fall of Rome and the Roman Empire, in the 10th century, clergymen seeking to bring life and color to the tone of the Bible stories began presenting simple tableau. These grew more and more elaborate and became the miracle plays of the Middle Ages. It has some pictures of, you know, some artist depictions of miracle plays from other pictures. Looks like Hermantia Bosch, as a matter of fact, there, Hermaeus Bosch, whatever his name Hieronymus. is. Hieronymus. Hieronymus Bosch. Bosch yeah. and it, anyway, it got, it's like Bosch, it's, it's like his things, which may have come from a miracle play. But it talks about it. First, they were given inside the churches, and later they were moved outside and performed on stages set up by the church porches around the entrance. Uh, ordinary clothes were worn except for the case of angels and devils. Angels being fitted with robes and wings, the devils consumed with great imagination. Um, they presented these hideously costumed as so and so. They, they gave price to the parts. And then it says the plays of the Middle Ages. In the time of the guilds, something like our trade unions, uh, made up of craftsmen, took over performance of the mystery and miracle plays following the old Greek custom. Men played all the parts at first, although women may have been allowed to play later on. All over Europe, people flocked to the miracles and the mysteries, which were presented in a number of ways. Sometimes, particularly in each England, each act of the play was presented on a large wagon called a pageant, which was moved from place to place and town to town. Uh, watching several acts of the same place, a person could see a whole play. The pageants were large and big enough to be uh, uh, the stage was a dressing room, the stage was usually covered. And it goes on and on and talks about England developed the morality play, which dealt entirely with the vices and virtues and the struggle between the two. Passion plays depicting the events of the life of Christ sometimes lasted a month. One act being performed each day until the story is complete. So, and, and it talks about Uber Amergau. But the point I want to make to you is, this is a huge, huge, huge part of the history in, of, of the West, right? That comes directly out of the Greek. And I don't mean to be, uh, you know, whatever depreciating about it, but obviously our education system is not covering some of the most basic kind of fundamental stuff that is, I was lucky, I guess, because I got out of Funk and Wagon's children's, you know, dictionary when I was a kid, and I just love this stuff. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> along with art pieces and things, these were the visual media of that time. It was. You heard the gospel in church, but they're just spoken words. Put images to it. You went to these things to see them acted out before you, and so they became more real to you, just like watching a, a movie or a television yeah. show does for us today. So. And it was read in Latin. The, they read the Latin. They didn't read it, the Gospels and everything in English or Greek or the language. Thank you, Father, for your word. Pray you look after us this week in your name. We pray. Amen.